Assalamu alaikum. Sadat Sahib, Tashif Lai, Yaman Pass, Batim. Assalamu alaikum. Please be seated. Adi, Shukare, please. Is it uh, in English or Urdu or what? English, okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, I'm Vaseem Uddin from Manchester. You're right. The question is this. Um, Youth crime is ever increasing in this country. Uh, new proposals have been put forward that parents are responsible for their children's crimes. Can I have your views on that, please, sir? As far as I'm concerned, these are not new proposals. You watch the MTA of three, four, five years before, and this is exactly what I've been telling them that your homes are becoming factories for crime. And the parents are not discharging their responsibilities because of certain reasons. And because of interference by the social services into private homes. So there are so many factors which I have been explaining for the last so many years. And now they are coming to grapple them at last. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Huzu. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, Huzu, my question is this. Uh, some scientists claim that uh, the evolutionary progress of man, that is physical evolution, is limitless. Uh, and they claim that uh, subtle changes within the environment will eventually make man change into a form. Which, which is scientists have told you this? Well, I read it in scientists, hmm? uh, in journals, that... Uh, Changes within the environment will eventually make man change. You know, they are not talking of the things which you are telling me. Those changes are different. Evolutionary processes within a species happen or occur because of environmental requirements. But they simply do not change the species. For instance, viruses go through a rapid evolution in their character to meet the new challenge, challenges posed to them by antibiotics. So they keep changing their form to suit themselves and to become a better brand to combat antibiotics. Many theories have been put forward. Some of them suggest that uh, it is not that sort of evolution which people know about. What happens is that already viruses are inconsistent in their inner making. There's so many viruses which have different characters. So a wild, a, a, a wide variety of viruses are already in existence. So when an antibiotic kills some of those who are weak against the, those and the, against the antibiotics, then whichever remain, they spread. And it appears as if they have evolved. They were already there, but because lack of competition, because of the lack of competition, they have a greater freedom to spread. So already work has been done on this and is being in process. And they have not yet finally decided what's happening. But among viruses, particularly the cold viruses and influenza viruses, they have found such amazing things that they cannot control. They have to invent new antibiotics every time something happens. Every remedy which worked once in influenza would not work again, while the influenza symptoms will remain the same. Do you understand? As far as the progress for the future is concerned, now the evolution has taken a different route. It is the evolution of brain evolution of faculties. And man has left animal kingdom far behind, not in physical evolution, but mental 
and potential evolution, uh, uh, mental evolution, and evolution of the potentials man is provided with. It's a completely different story. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Hazur. Wa alaikum salam. I have a question about a non Ahmadi but Muslim friend. Yes. He is very pious and outwardly and in his views about Islam is very much like an Ahmadi would view things. The only thing is when it comes to the Promise of Sayyid alayhi salam, he gets, he's very anti because of his social how, environment. How can you call him pious then? This is, that's what I'm saying, outwardly pious on everything except when it comes to Ahmadiyya. If any man is pious, the first prerequisite for being pious is taqwa, fear of God. And no one with any element of fear of God would open his mouth against a commissioned reformer, if not prophet. Any reformer is commissioned by him. Moreover, if he has fear of God, he would not open his mouth against anyone whom he doesn't know. So that shows his piety is just a display business. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with the piety of heart and soul. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamualaikum, Hazur. Wa alaikum salam. Hazur, um, last Thursday when I went to school, a lot of my Muslim friends were fasting. And the reason being was that they said it was due to Shabrat. So my question was, that uh, has this been any kind of a tradition in the history of Islam that Muslims should fast I've Shabrat? already answered this question during my last question and answer session, last but uh, previous to the last, that these uh, ceremonies like Shabrat, etc., are absolutely unknown during the time of Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah so Shabarat should have its roots in his time, if at all it is real. But you read about this in the traditional, traditional literature, like uh, books of Ahadis, of much later centuries, of centuries, say, so far removed from the uh, first period as by 500 years or so. So how could you believe in those things? They seem to be the inventions of Sufi-minded people who wanted to give people a shortcut to heaven. Do whatever you like, all your life. Wake up for one night and pray that you die before morning so that you can go straight to heaven. It's all sheer nonsense. No such shortcuts have ever been provided, have been suggested by any prophet of God. They all call you to the path of perseverance and lab hard labor and a spiritual exercise, which has to be a lifetime occupation. And if you die during that spiritual exercise of yours, as I said, it is a lifetime occupation then you should consider yourself as having succeeded. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. By the way, you yes. have ceased to introduce yourselves Previously, I had told the questioners to say a few words, brief a brief introduction. Huh? Thank you. And then start framing your question or whatever you have to say. Uh, you are? Uh, uh, my name is Abdurrahman Muhammad. Yes. From Islamabad. No, previously. From Tanzania. Yeah, that's right. I have one question. See, some Zuru. people say Tanzania, some say Tanzania. Which is the correct pronunciation? It is Tanzania. Tanzania? Yes. Not Tanzania? 
I think I have heard it on radio and television being pronounced as Tanzania. But some people, particularly Pakistanis coming from there, call it Tanzania. You are not sure about it. <laughs> it seems that you do not belong to Tanzania or Tanzania. <laughs> you may have belonged to an island close <laughs> to Tanzania. Is that right? Yeah, from Zanzibar, but it is part of Tanzania. From Zanzibar, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that is it. Yes, please. Yeah, Huzur, I have one question with two parts, A and B, and maybe the second part will be covered uh, in your answer with the first part. Uh, but let's see. Okay. <laughs> uh, my question is that, uh, what is the difference between meditation and remembrance of God? Meditation could be anything, about anything. And remembrance of God is remembrance of God. You, when you meditate on God, then it is a remembrance of God as well as meditation. When you meditate on any other thing, it is just simple meditation. You understand? Thank you. And the second part is that uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes when uh, I concentrate in the remembrance of God, you yes yes, I get headache. So <laughs> what is uh, what is your uh, What's your advice <laughs> on this? <laughs> so I don't know what, <laughs> what Satan is after you to prevent you from meditation on God. But uh, I think maybe there is some physical illness you, don't, you have not yet discovered. When you attentively concentrate on something, then the rush of blood to the brain is causing this. So it's not meditation on God at all. It is just meditation. You can meditate on any other subject and the same, will, same thing will happen to you. Headache is not called by the remembrance of God. The headache is, is caused by the meditation. Right? Yes. So try to meditate on any other thing. And let me know if you do get headache or not. Thank okay? You. Thank you. Thank you. Salam alaikum, Hazur. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, my name is Kaleem Bhatti from uh, Reading, Jamaat. From Reading? Yeah. Right. Um, my question is uh, regarding the, the soul and uh, some of its processes. There's some non Vedic ideas not from Hindu belief, that um, on reincarnation that suggests that um, the different abilities and the temperaments and what we've got in this world. Um, well, what are you talking about? Soul or incarnation or reincarnation, reincarnation. or what? Huh? Reincarnation. reincarnation. It's okay. sort of justifying reincarnation. Okay. And um, so all that we've got. Have you any read anything about reincarnation? Yeah, from, from Hindu tradition mainly. Uh, but what is the philosophy of reincarnation? The philosophy of reincarnation hmm? is, well, from a Hindu point of view, it's that um, we're all uncreated and, and we continually go round and round, basically. Why? Um, I, I can't remember, actually. So you better improve your knowledge of reincarnation before you ask your well, question. I know about Arya Samaj, that side, but... Arya Samaj are just one part of Hinduism. Yeah. But you should, first of all, find out what is reincarnation. Mm. Now, if you had read the Arya Smaj literature, mm. you would have come across the beginning of reincarnation in the sense that they say, with dew, some soul also drops on grass. Mm. And when that grass is eaten by animals, that soul enters them and through their milk or other things it may enter another or by the by if someone eats their meat they enter his body so it's all 
sheer rubbish. It has no scientific evidence, nothing whatsoever. Mm. But that is not all. The reason why they say there has to be reincarnation is that someone, first of all, they believe in the separation of soul and body. They believe that souls are flying in, in space without any purpose, without any beginning, they're as eternal as God is. And matter also is eternal. So they believe what God does is to combine a part of matter with a soul. And this wedlock between the soul and the matter produces what we know as life on earth. Why should he do it? He has not created. He is not the master of either soul or matter. Why should he bind them together? When you inquire from them, then the reasons they give are absolutely nonsense. They say soul and matter are independent. This is their nirvana. This is the life of deliverance for everything. God puts them together because sometimes before they were united and they committed sins. So after having been released from this forced union, they are brought back to reunion because of some crimes they might have committed a trillion years ago. But how did it all start? That is the question. Why initially did God join both soul and matter while he had no right to do so? And the position of the, the surgeon on earth is also described in a manner that no sane man can ever accept it. They say when the soul and the matter are reunited, they are given birth in the form of a child, human child. That child might have been a good dog of the owner who behaved well, so he was raised in status and he got born in the family to which that dog belonged before his death. Anything can happen. Even some people can be turned into worms in the tummy of other people because they are also a form of a wedlock between soul and matter. Why did the worms, why were the worms produced at all? Because billions of years before maybe, the living had committed some sins and they were demoted in the order of their rebirth. Instead of being born as men, they got demoted into dogs, cats, rats, etc., etc., until at last they were created as worms. Now maybe the worms in the tummy of these Hindus were their ancestors once. Who knows? So all this rigma role of reincarnation is sheer stupidity. But the Western people want to live again. That is the only reason why they believe in this. Because they do not believe in God, because they cannot visualize their rebirth in the spiritual next world, in the next spiritual world. So they forget about all that is that causes the rebirths, the philosophy of reincarnation, they not, do not care for. They visualize a rebirth into a human form again. That is the only reason why they believe. And it is there they are misled intentionally by many Hindus who would like this to become popular in the West and because of that they will 
get a sort of uh, psychological boost that our belief is all nowadays accepted by the West, you know. That's the reason why they go on doing it. But one should tell them that you are very mistaken when you think that you will be reborn into a human again. Because your actions here on, in the world, your ungodly character, your crimes, are such as you would be much more likely to be born as dogs and cats, or more probably as donkeys. <laughs> this is the reincarnation. Thank you. Okay, exactly. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Aziz Ahmed Hafiz. I am changing the direction because when I turn my face, the voice gets lost or subdued. Now I think when I face it in this direction, I will be able to face you as well as the microphones. Zur, I have two questions if Zur permits. Please ask the first one. Zur, in light of the present political turmoil in Pakistan, where does Hazur see the country heading in the next few years? To greater confusion. <laughs> <laughs> Second question. <laughs> Sir, I've recently returned from Ghana, and there I've seen the spread of homeopathy is really taking hold in the country, especially as a result of the Jamaat's homeopathic of course, clinics. Yes. So how does Azur see the role of homeopathy within medical care, within health care, in the third world and in the world generally in the next few years? In the developed world, they are experimenting on homeopathy with uh, surprising results. All modern researches, through the help of the most modern electronic devices, they have discovered two things. Yes. One, that the medicine which is supposed to have something in it yeah. does not have anything. Okay. While it is prepared from a poison or whatever it is, and 30th potency and beyond, the medium which dissolves the medicine is there, but the medicine has disappeared. Totally, completely. There's one thing which they have found 100% correct. The second, the symptomatology of diseases which are, which should have been affected by these medicines, certainly shows signs of influence of this medicine. Inner changes happen. The human defenses work exactly in the way that the homeopaths tell they should work, they begin to awaken and work against the presence of a disease. A recent research from, in, from France was published, and other, I think, was also televised here in England, that uh, this is an amazing thing. We can't understand why homeopathy should work, but we now understand that it does work. Thank you. So this is for the first world. Okay. For the third world, they don't care whether the philosophy is right or wrong. Okay. They only are concerned with the results. Yes. If anything produces results, it's good for them. Okay. Zakla. Salam alaikum, Hazur. Wa alaikum salam. My name is Teb Hayat of East Region. Right. And my question is. Hazur, there are many stories in the Holy Quran, for example, about Prophet Moses salam, striking the rock and water coming out. But how are these stories relevant to us in our day-to-day -day lives? What would you answer this? How would you answer this question? <laughs> they should improve your day-to-day -day life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Tariq Bajwa. I'm from Mosque 
Halka. <coughs> Azur, my question is, uh, although you have uh, very well clarified on the topic of the belief that it is obligatory for all Ahmadis, um, sometimes I have uh, a question from some of the Ahmadis about the verse, that this verse has specifically said that there is a party which is, uh, has to do this job specifically. So we are working in a different capacity, although we are working for Jamaat, but we, are, we have different capability and we can work more in a certain field and not in this public field. And uh, so can you clarify about this verse, please. You see, you can work in any other area of uh, serving the cause of religion, and that is a must. But this verse is misapplied here. This applies to people who should take care of the social habits, the social <coughs> values of a certain people, and they should rise above them by calling them to the right path and by preventing them from the wrong path. Above them in the sense that such people cannot be all of the society. If all of the society has become this, how can they be differentiated from the others? When you admonish someone, you have to ha acquire some qualities which others do not have. If you admonish someone to be truthful, you have to be truthful. Yes. So if the society is equal, then the whole society will be involved in this task. But the society is never equal. There are many people who are good in one thing and many people who are good in another thing. And they are the groups which the Holy Quran is uh, suggesting should work in spreading those qualities of goodness which they possess and in preventing those evil habits which they do not have. Otherwise, they would themselves become criminals. You understand? Yes. So it has nothing to do with tabligh. As far as, far as the tabligh goes, the Holy Quran addresses Ahazar sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says, Balligh ma unzil, ma unzil, 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 unzil alayka min rabbik. Aage padhe ma, fail lam? Fail lam tafal fuma balligh ta risalata. Fail lam tafal. Fail lam tafal ma balligh ta risalata. That you convey the message which God has granted you. And it is a must on you. If you do not do that, you have not discharged the responsibility of prophethood. Now, can any Ahmadi believe that only Muhammad Rasulullah should start the bleer, doing the bleer, and the rest should sit idle, idly by? When it is essential for him to convey the message, it automatically becomes essential for all those who follow him. So that is why in all the verses in which preaching is mentioned, there is no discrimination made between one group and the other. All of the Muslims are required to preach to others. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, from Huddersfield. Yes. Um, the recent private members' bill in the House of Commons on fo fox hunting got overwhelming support, which indicates public opinion going towards that direction. Uh, Hazur, what's your views uh, on sports such as, not in particular fox hunting, but shooting and fishing? Is See, it seen two, as. Two different things. You don't mix them with fox hunting. Islam prohibits all Muslims to take life unnecessarily, to destroy life. No one has any right. That is why you should shoot only such things as are consumed 
or are creating some uh, negative, are playing some negative role in the things which support you, support you. For instance, they may destroy farm produces and uh, fruits of the trees, anything which grows in the field. If they are becoming a nuisance and they endanger the, your survival by destroying the food you have produced, then you have every right to kill them, but not otherwise. Islam, according to Islam, those birds, for instance, which are not edible, but which remove a few corns from your field for their survival, they should not be killed for that crime. But if after eating their belly full, they begin to destroy the crop as such, then you have every right to destroy them. Understand? This is a principle which is universal, which should be applied to all games of shooting and all killing of injurious animals. The defense in favor of the fox, in the favor of, in the, favor of the hunting of fox, foxes, is taken on the, these lines. Those who defend this, they say the foxes are an, a, a species of animal, if left alone to themselves, they will destroy farms and large land of farmers and will render it profitless. With the result that uh, the country will gradually be turned barren. If foxes, foxes are given a free hand to play, they will destroy uh, many farms, many fields, etc., etc. The question is, this is what has to be investigated. If the foxes do, do, do such great damage to the uh, crops as they interfere with the survival of humans, then they should be put off or they may be killed, not necessarily by the sort of shooting, for sort of uh, sh uh, hunting they do on horses and along with the help of the uh, dogs, they should be somehow killed to bring them to a minimum number of existence so that they do not play havoc with humans. You understand? Fishing. Because I was thinking of taking it up, but now I've got some doubts. Uh, well, perhaps it is difficult for me to answer because I'm very fond of fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I is it the same argument uh, uh, no. in relation to that? How could it be? You don't you eat fish? Yes, of course we do. So, yes. that I said in the beginning. <laughs> if you kill an animal for human consumption, then it's permitted. Say Bismillah, Allah Akbar, and go on fishing if you like. <laughs> Jazakal. Jazakal. But have you ever tried fishing? No, I was thinking of taking it up. So, uh, have you seen anybody catch fish? I have actually in, in the canal in Huddersfield. It's, it's, it's very popular where we usually have they, our cricket tournaments. I know, it's very popular for people to go fishing. Yes. But have you ever seen them bringing fish home? Not that many, no. Um, <laughs> not any. Not that many is the wrong answer. I haven't seen anybody take any fish, let's put That's it. That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Please. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum um, assalam. My name is Zahid Napol, and uh, originally I'm from Mauritius. From Mauritius? That's right. Right. Um, Hazur, I've got a question that... Um, you don't, don't look like a Mauritian very much, I think. <laughs> I thought you could be... You could pass as any Punjabi or... <laughs> 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 Are you really a Mauritian? Yes, sir. Good. I'm always... I'm, sometimes some people mistake me for being Bangladeshi. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 
Bangladeshi <laughs> or from India, That's anywhere. Right. Yeah. My grandparents are from South India, sir. That's it. That's, That's right. it. Okay. So my question is, um, it's uh, our, the the mail that we have in the Jamaat that um, you know we email, you know we discuss things on the internet, <laughs> like from the emails. And there were there were two questions. Well, first one, I'll ask you the first one, which, uh, well, the, we were discussing it, and you know the answer is not, you know, very conclusive. That's why I'd like Uzur to throw some light Please. on this. Um, Muslim men are allowed to marry people of the book. Pardon? Muslim men are allowed to marry people of the book. Can Huzur define the people of the book? Does it include Christians who believe in Trinity and non Ahmadi Muslims? Non Ahmadi Muslims are most certainly people of the book, the Quran. And the Christians and the Jews, both are the people of the book. There's no shadow of doubt about that. Right? Thank you. Uh, so, Christians who believe in Trinity, do this? The Muslims who bow to or and prostrate to graves and to so-called saints, do they not indulge in idolatry? Still they're Muslims. So the Holy Quran has given them this license of holding on to a book and doing whatever they like, but that will not be granted as the, they will, that will not be in any way of avail to them when they return to God. So as long as, long as they tarry here on earth, they'll be referred to as the people of the book, because this is what they claim. But as far as their inner th thoughts or their outer actions are concerned, if they are idolatrous, they will not be treated by God as the people of the book in the hereafter. Right? And the second question, um, it's regarding assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the questions was like, um, did Hazrat Muhammad Sallam say, Sallam say salam to the Jews as well, or was he using a different termolo yes, terminology? Yes, he did. He was using salam alaikum, was it? Yes. Okay. The Thank mullahs you. don't say that, but Rasulullah used to say salam alaikum to all. You see, there are many traditions which indicate that, and the Quran also refers to that, that when people came to him, they addressed him with good wishes. And many a time they said assalamu alaikum with a twist of their tongue, while in reality they were not saying assalamu alaikum but assamu alaikum. Like some people hurriedly pronounce the word assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum. You don't hear an L in between. So assam means uh, destruction. Assam means curse. So by this criminal twist of their tongue, they made it appear as if they were saying assalamu alaikum. And uh, actually if they're saying, they were calling for a curse, na'uz billah min zalik, upon Rasulullah sallam. And he used to answer them. That is the question. Once Hazrat Aisha Siddiqa was with Rasulullah Sallam when a Jew passed by and said, Assalamu Alaikum. Rasulullah said something in answer. Hazrat Aisha Siddiqa pointed out that, Ya Rasulullah, didn't you hear? He was saying, Assalamu Alaikum. Why did you return this greeting? He said, didn't you hear me? I said, alaikum. Instead of wa alaikum, he just said alaikum. Wa alaikum was salam, or wa alaikum was salam means, and also upon you. But when you say alaikum, it means on you, not on me. <laughs> so 
this was a practice in Medina. Rasulullah Sallam used to address others with Assalamu Alaikum and he was addressed by others by this greeting of Assalamu Alaikum and sometimes of course some crooked people misused this opportunity and uh, you know, turned it into a curse instead. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. I just, I just wanted to know what would be the outcome of children who are caught up in a vicious circle. A few weeks ago, if the children are caught up, are moving in a vicious circle. That's right. The outcome, outcome will be vicious. But how will they be, you know, when they grow up? Will it be any, will it, what is their responsibility? How, how can they be judged for what their parents did? And you see, when you said they are in a vicious circle, the answer is, it is evil which they will earn if they remain in that circle. The circle has to be broken somehow when they grow to adulthood and they are made to understand that what they are doing is not good. So the question but, is, yes. Ah, yes, but Sorry. what is? But the question is then, how do we break this? I mean... By admonition, by persuasion, by love, by <coughs> displaying a godly conduct in you. Attack others to your own personality. And these people who unfortunately are brought up in bad atmosphere or evil atmosphere, when they say somebody different from them and good, the basic nature of man remains the same. It's good. The basic nature is good. So even the evil people fall in love with goodness. When they confront it from close quarters, they are invariably influenced. So they will not be influenced by your words. You may tell them you're wrong, they will not care. But if they see you being good in the society, that will certainly influence them, inshallah. Just one more but that is difficult. Huh? Very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask one more question, please? Please, please, please. Sure. I was just wondering, when we all pass away, we are judged for what we have done on this earth. For our, for our crimes, our positives and our bad, bad things. For children that grow eventually up, would it, how would they be judged? Well, because if they have lived always in an environment... They will not be judged by you. Mm. <laughs> They'll be judged by God who knows everything. Mm. Yeah. He knows the environments in which they were brought up. He mm. knows the natural influences the environments play. So he will judge everyone according to his knowledge, not according to your knowledge. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum sir. Wa alaikum salam. Khalid Munir Ahmed. Pardon? Khalid Munir Ahmed. No, no, no. You have introduced, introduced, introduced yourself wrongly. You should tell me you are Frida's husband. <laughs> because she is doing a wonderful job for me. Thank you, sir. In the revision of the book which I'm writing, eh? <laughs> you have a very responsible, knowledgeable wife sir. who goes into the depth of the matter whenever she advises me about some sentences to be changed. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Please. Hazur, uh, Torah was revealed on Hazrat Musa and uh, Hazrat Isa did not bring any new Sharia. Then what is the difference between Torah and Injil and Bible? What is the difference between the Quran and Tazkira? Tazkira uh, is the Tashri uh, of Quran? No, not directly. Uh, it's a book of Ilhamat of Masih Madhul right. None of those revelations contradict any verse of the Quran. Right, sir. And all of them lie within the within the teachings of the Quran. None is either addition or subtraction. But they are revelations. Such is the case of 
the Anjil. Like Isa was given an Anjil, Hazrat Musiyah of the Rasulat was salam, who was born in his likeness, was given this Tazkara. And both do not contradict the book they follow. Right? Yeah, thank you. Right. Assalamu alaikum, Wa alaikum salam. Imran Ali from Luton. Yes. Um, can Azur recommend an effective uh, way of countering the non-Islamic influences that our youth are facing daily in universities and uh, the, the society as a gen in general? What should we do? Well, yeah, what is the effective mechanism of uh, countering them? In which society was Ahmed Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam born? Tell me. In the, uh, was he born in an Islamic society? No. Huh? no. A society which was totally inimical to the values of Islam. What did he do? Understand that and try doing that. Thank you. <coughs> yes. No, <Islam> none. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the benefit of introducing myself, I'm Ibrahim Noonan from Ireland. <laughs> Azur, um, uh, I'm just wondering, should the Khudam al youth uh, organization or the youth themselves, should they have an Islamic identity? Meaning that uh, based on the answer you've just given, that uh, we see so many youths today who are Muslims born in Muslim families, but their appearance and their their materialistic ways are not very Islamic. So should we have an Islamic identity, meaning so that other people can see that we're Muslims? Of course. It's very important. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Any other question? Have they eaten food? So that is why they are a damp name. Assalamualaikum. <laughs> 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 well, the tea has, has the tea has become water. <laughs> Pakoras may have stayed behind, <laughs> <laughs> but still I see some signs of hunger on their faces. Eh? Are you ready to take food or not yet? No. Well, I can sit longer then. Please. Ahmed Jamal from Slough. And, uh, my you are? Ahmed Jamal. Yes, from? From Slough. Oh. And uh, my question is about Nation of Islam. And I understand that the founder of Nation of Islam was uh, Muhammad Elijah. And uh, that before uh, he was an Ahmadi before he, went, he found Nation of Islam. Uh, could you tell us why he actually left Ahmadi? A new book has come on Islam from America from a professor of religion who belongs to Afro-American Afro people. Mm -hmm. He has done a lot of research on these things. And uh, I'm amazed how he has shown such boldness as to tell the whole world that it is the Ahmadis who remain loyal to Islam everywhere. And they were the first cause of bringing Islam into the United States. About Elijah, I have made some investigation. Because I met with one of his sons in America, who seemed to be a very well-balanced person. So I made some investigation as to who he was and what happened to him. In the beginning, he accepted Ahmadiyyat at the hand of Hazrat Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Sahib. And he remained as an Ahmadi Muslim for a while. But afterwards, they, along with Elijah Muhammad, became a political party within religion. And they tried to utilize Islam to gain their own ulterior motives. To gain, they claimed, political freedom from uh, white Americans and so on. Mm -hmm. 
So they became harbingers of hatred based on colors. Mm -hmm. And this could not be approved by Jamaat Ahmadiyya. So he was told off. Or maybe he himself realized that this Jamaat would no longer have him as such with these views. So he walked out of Jamaat Ahmadiyya and started his own separate movement. This movement is not a religious movement. This movement is an exploiter of religion. And uh, there is nothing Islamic in the character of Elijah Muhammad's teaching. It is all based on the superiority of the black against the inferiority of the white and so on and so forth. But although he made a lot of stir, his movement couldn't gain anything for the black people. In fact, it was rather det detrimental to their cause because it made them confront with a society which was far more powerful. And in that confrontation, they lost. And their attention was drawn instead of towards education and better know-how of so many things, of industry, etc. They lost all their mind and brain power or the potentials in pursuing a movement of hatred which could get them nowhere. So I don't want to explain in detail what Elijah Muhammad stood for, but now even his son, I think it was Akbar who met me, he fully agreed with my explanation of what Ahmadiyat was. Absolutely. He stood up, you can see him on television. He stood up and said, yes, I, I agree with you. So now is the time for us to persuade these people by logic, by better argument. And gradually, I think, inshallah, we'll be able to at least get a sizable portion of them if we start working rightly on the younger generations. Thank you. <coughs> Another question from Africa this time or from here? No, this is from America actually. <laughs> from America. <Okay. laughs> Very good. <laughs> Salaam alaikum. Um, I was reading on the MDR internet email uh, discussion group recently that one of our MD brothers in America, they have read in a journal, the American Journal of Neuroscience, that some people have done some studies on a group of people, and they, when they think about God, they've made them think about God. These are atheists or not very godly people. There's a particular section in the brain which always lights up, and they're saying that this may be going towards proving There's nothing new in that. Whenever you think of something, there's a spot in the brain which is activated. They seem so to it think doesn't, doesn't mean anything. It doesn't prove the existence of God in the least. Because even if you think negatively of God, the same center will be activated. See? Thank you. Exactly. Next, please. We have to finish this by half past seven. Huh? Right. And still we have five minutes to go. Okay. okay. Asalaamu Alaikum Hazrat. Wa Alaikum Asalaam. Hazrat, my name is Zaheer Hayat from uh, New Malden. But you were supposed to go to Pakistan, were you not? Uh, to to uh, Essex, not to Pakistan. Hazrat. To Essex. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but your brother was. Uh, yes, he's, he's gone. He huh? went today. Your brother. Yes. What's his name? Lake. Oh, yes. Yes. They went it this was morning. Lake who was going to Pakistan, not you. That's right. You're only going to Essex. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Okay, <laughs> please. Uh, so as a question? As a parent uh, with young children, I, I am abhorred to read almost daily in the newspapers of abuses on children. Yes. Can Hazur please comment on why this society is guilty of such crimes on its own children? Because they're piggish in their habits. They eat pig and they eat the flesh of swine and that has to have some influence on their character. This is one of the reasons why God has prohibited us from eating swine. 
the flesh of swine, I mean. This is one animal which is basically vegetarian. It is not carnivorous. It, it eats the produce of farms, and yet when its own children die, the piglets die, it eats them up. So this is a piggish habit, which, have, which has gone into their blood. <laughs> you understand? Yes. But now, other factors are promoting it. Not only this, because they've been eating the flesh of swine for thousands, a, a thousand or more years, but this has uh, unfortunately influenced their attitude to children but not in such an ugly manner as you observe today in the society. Their crime of sex, their so-called promiscuity in becoming homosexual and this and that, it has made them crave for some kick. If they can't get it from outside, they get it from within their homes because no concept of God can stand between their ugliness in themselves. So these things become nothing. To satiate their sex with an outsider or with a child of their own has no difference for them. So the background is basically atheism. Atheism has played havoc on a society which used to eat the flesh of pig and it got some tendencies from that flesh which have been supported by a way of life which knows no God. Right? Exactly. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Another question, and that is going to be the last one. Huh? Asalaamu Alaikum, Hazar. Shahnawaz Rashid from North London. Yes. Um, my question also relates to homeopathic medicine. As, as relates to what? Homeopathic okay. medicine. Um, I understand how about the medicine, as you said earlier, makes a memory or some kind in the fluid in which it is, which acts on the body and causes the response. But there's so many contaminants in water and food, like there's arsenic in the water that we drink and there's sulfur in the food that we eat. Does that have but an effect? They are very strong. The, the presence of these things is not homeopathic presence. It is allopathic presence. In homeopathy, things are diluted to such an extent that they ultimately disappear. So when you talk of polluted water, mm. they do not disappear from there. Otherwise, you will not address that water to be polluted. Mm. So they don't have any effect on our health and our... What? You know, the s Pollution? There's some very, very small contaminants as well, sometimes. What, whenever you drink contaminated water, it is not homeopathic medicine you're having. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And that is that, right? One more question? Okay. Well, some, no, we go to Mauritius again. Huh? Yes. My name is Shahid Banu. Yes. Um, my question is, the knowledge of very big developments, such as the building of the pyramids, uh, the knowledge has been lost. So why is it taking people so much time to regain that original knowledge? Huh? To, to I understood the first part, yes. which is the knowledge which goes to the building of pyramids yes. this has been lost. Yes, it's okay. been lost. So my question is, why is it taking people so, many, so much time to regain that knowledge? The, you know, the, the, um, <laughs> the researchers. They're spending so much time to regain anything is lost. Why not this knowledge? Knowledge is a pursuit. A pursuit into what the Holy Quran describes as al ghayb of that which is not seen. So when you pursue into the ghab and try to find out what is hidden 
from you while it exists. Then you take something of the rab and turn it into the present and it becomes knowledge, new knowledge gained. So in fact, all our new knowledge, which we seem to have created anew, is not new at all. It always existed. We couldn't catch it. It remained unknown to us. So man's pursuit into nothingness is producing something. It's not a waste of time. Thank you. That was a really last question? Okay. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, my sessions with you are always very fruitful to me, and I enjoy them very much. But we have to pay respect to time as well. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>